Uh, hi everyone, thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, we're recording this um, Thursday, 8th of July, 2021. Um, those of you watching on the Facebook Live will um, have already seen the three lions on my shirt, and this is due to the increasing probability that football is coming home in the next few days. Um, but as I know that football isn't a big, uh, big deal in Australia as, as much as it is here, we're going to get straight on with and um, welcome our uh, guest this evening for episode 94, and that is Dr. David Klein. Um, episode is on sleep, the importance of sleep, the relevance of sleep, um, why we think we as clinicians should should care about sleep or, or at least entertain the, the, the notion that sleep should be discussions we're, we're, we're having in our clinic. Um, David, uh, by way of brief introduction, is a research fellow at UQ. Um, work focusing on um, primarily on understanding the physiology of pain um, and the complex mechanisms that drive its persistence and as such sleep being a very big part of the, of the current work he's doing so I'm sure he'll remind he'll he'll, he'll be uh, keen for me to remind you all he's he's not a sleep scientist but he does have certain insights into sleep that I think are going to be incredibly uh, interesting and important for us to hear so first of all the uh, I'll welcome you David and I'll say the the irony of asking you to get up at 4 45 a.m to join us for an episode on on sleep uh, hasn't hasn't passed us by so thank you um very much for joining us <laughs> of course well thanks for um having me by and i it's um i'm a bit like a car mechanic right we probably drive the worst um uh, car on the street we don't look after it as well as we should um, so yeah sleep's one of those things for me i don't get enough of it well you're in good company there because craig and i are not renowned for having strong relationships with with long duration good quality sleep either so perhaps we all of us can can preach a bit and then and then later on perhaps try to practice it as well um here's here's where i think we should or where i'd like to start if it's okay and um it's a question i suspect uh, our our viewing audience our listening audience who are primarily clinicians may well have as well and it and it it sort of came up when I was at dinner with my wife in the last hour or so, and she saw in our joint diary that I had an episode of Pod Chat Live this evening, and she said, oh, well, you know, just making small talk, what's uh, what's tonight's episode on? I said, oh, we're doing an episode on sleep, and she she turned to me and, and, and said, why? Um, and um, I thought that's a reasonable thing to ask, and, and certainly we may have clinicians saying, why why, why are we doing an episode on sleep? Why is, as, as, you know, podiatrists, are we doing an episode on sleep? Why should we care about sleep? Um, Perhaps we should start there and you can kind of give us your insight into, you know, the why behind this episode. It's a really good question. Um, and I think a lot of people will be thinking that. Um, and I, one of the, the bits of critical information from our research, um, I think, is to get across to the general public um, why sleep is important because people, it, it, the knowledge, it's not out there um, at the moment. I think um, a real understanding that sleep through certain real physiological pathways can affect all sorts of health conditions. And I start by saying that um, sleep is a basic necessity um, of life, right? It's, 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 it's as essential as oxygen, food, water, all those things. If you don't sleep in a short period of time, you will die. Um, if you have a few hours lost in one night, you can feel pretty ordinary the next day. So while the benefits of good sleep um, uh, uh, are quite obvious, um, the consequences really are only just starting to be understood. And that's why sleep is a really hot topic of research now. Um, and a lot of people are taking notice. Um, what we do know is, is that sleep is partly regulated by inflammation, um, but it also impacts inflammation. Um, and I think if you take away anything from this talk, it's um, that association that sleep is highly associated with bodily inflammation. And then you take another step back and have a think about that. Well, inflammation um, is associated with so many um, diseases, disorders, conditions, right from our mind, um, through the right to the periphery, our tissues, our cells, um, including pain. And so what I would say is if you're um, wondering why sleep is important, well, think of all the disorders and diseases out there that you can think of, and then Google them and and have a look into whether inflammation is involved and you probably will find that it is. So that's why sleep is important. Um, and I look at it from a pain perspective. Um, you know, I think most people would be aware that if you hurt yourself, um, you have an inflammatory response and it's that inflammation that's sensitizing your nerves, which is triggering your brain to say, hey, I got pain. Um, and that's how we look at inflammation from a pain point of view. 
um, acutely, a chronic version of pain, eventually that inflammation in the periphery or around those tissues is not as important in his, in, anymore. It's actually the inflammation in the brain that's stimulating those um, areas or nerves that are associated with pain perception. Um, so taking a broad step back, sleep is incredibly important um, from a health perspective um, for many reasons, but the reason that I look at it is for because of its role in regulating inflammation. Yeah, and, and, and certainly I've, I've uh, I know, you know, during lockdown, um, one, one book that was really popularly doing the rounds on social media and, and on the Amazon bestseller list was the, the book Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. And as I was skimming through it it, 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 it suddenly dawned on me that if you were struggling to sleep, if you if you didn't have a great relationship with sleep, as I don't, it, it was a terrible thing to read because it just it terrified me into thinking I wasn't sleeping enough and, and the worry and anxiety probably in, interfered with my ability to fall asleep. But it was suggesting, like you say, that, that if you sleep well, um, and we'll talk shortly about what sleep well may well mean, but you know, your learning capacity increased, your memory uh, increased, your time to physical exhaustion uh, when you're exercising was longer. And likewise, as you've just said, if you, if you don't sleep well, all of these lists of diseases are, are sort of um, laid out in front of you as possibilities. And even things like your, your uh, increase for salty cravings and sweet cravings and all the things that basically life starts to unravel really, really quickly if, if, if you don't sleep. But I think the thing we'll, we'll dial in on, particularly because of the, the audience we have and of the interest to us, is this relationship with pain. And you touched on it, this bi-directional relationship between um, when you're not sleeping, you know, if, if, you're, if you're really in pain or you've got really sensitive tissues, then you're not going to sleep well. But also if you're not sleeping well, then that can dial up your, your pain and your sensitivity levels. As clinicians who are often seeing people in pain, um, how do we tease out that kind of chicken egg, you know, cause effect kind of uh, scenario and what sort of questions should we be asking because it's it's we're, we're commonly taught to sort of ask about night pain as a sort of screening question for certain pathologies so could you give us some guidance uh, uh, how this this information you have and some of your work you've done might might sort of um inform our practice it's really challenging um so the the, the is it the chicken or the egg which comes first i mean that's that's a question that we're um heavily researching at the moment um, with sleep and pain uh, because as you said there is a bi-directional relationship um, so I think for a long time we've known that um, if you hurt yourself uh, that you you may have a, a bad night's sleep over several days uh, for a variety of reasons um, one of the reasons is um, that there is a there is a physiological relationship as far as inflammation goes that if there is a big enough inflammatory response that peripherally um, that inflammation can eventually end up in your circulation and that inflammation can cross the blood-brain barrier, can signal the brain to release a number of inflammatory mediators, cytokines, which is what we look at um, a lot. Um, and as I said earlier, that um, sleep is partly regulated by inflammation. So you can disturb sleep um, through just having an injury um, through inflammation that starts off in that peripheral tissue. Um, and there's a whole heap of stress responses as well. Um, if you, I mean, you were talking about stress before and anxiety, well, that activates um, a variety of different pathways from the top down. Um, one of them is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. It's a long word, but basically it's a pathway through which um, hormones and certain regulators are released. Um, and that can affect inflammation as well. And I can talk about that a little bit later. Um, but the other way, um, um, as I suggest, is that sleep can trigger inflammation. And it, it really does only take as little as um, one night's poor sleep. And it only has to involve uh, disrupted sleep um, or sleep deprivation of a few hours um, that you can really see an acute spike in inflammation. Um, so chicken or the egg, that's really challenging. Um, the reality is um, it's probably working both ways um, in a cyclic manner. Um, patient coming in, I think, I, if, if I putting myself in trying to put myself in a clinician's shoes and I'm not a clinician um, would be simply asking them about their sleep um, and if I was the, the key things I would want to tease out of someone to know whether sleep is the driving problem or is, is a driving problem um, and not so much the other way around um, that the sleep's being affected 
I would ask them whether they'd had a history of poor sleep beforehand. I mean, that's the key thing. So before the injury, um, uh, before the uh, condition, um, they, before they first noticed their condition that they're presenting with, did they have a history of poor sleep before? And that's probably a really important one. Um, because if they did have a history of poor sleep before, um, they may have had a primed inflammatory system, which really would have then taken off um, once they injured themselves. It doesn't take much. Um, so if you can, that if I was to, if someone didn't have a history of poor sleep, I would be thinking then perhaps their poor sleep is more affected by maybe their peripheral injury, but also a, a bunch of psychosocial things associated with that injury. Um, that would probably be the key thing. Um, if if the clinician was getting an idea that sleep might be a bit of a problem here, then you could narrow down on why their sleep is poor. Um, and this opens up a whole um, another another debate of what is good sleep. Um, and I, uh, I think you mentioned earlier. I mean, sleep is um, one of those things. I don't think we have a really good idea of what's good, bad, or indifferent. What I can say is, is that quality is more important than duration. Um, and we're starting to understand that now um, through really intricate um, studies that are looking at different stages of sleep. So whether it's human or animal studies where we can actually go into the brain, measure the activity and see what sleep at different stages um, is doing um, physiologically. So we have three or four stages that we go through with sleep and it cycles through those stages every 60 to 90 minutes. One of those stages is slow wave sleep, right? It's like deep sleep and it happens towards the end of that cycle. And during that phase, it might seem as though there's not a lot going on, but it's the busiest period um, of restoring your brain, washing out rubbish. Um, and during that process, there's a lot of inflammatory activity. So sleep is regulating a lot of mediators, proteins that are involved in inflammation. If you disturb that part of your sleep, what we're starting to think is that is the period that is, mo is heavily influencing your next day levels of inflammation. So what I would say is, um, and it, if, if you're having consistently interrupted sleep throughout the night, that's bad um, because it's probably taking away that slow wave sleep um, duration that you're meant to have. Um, and that's your, I would suggest, um, and this is th this is what we're actually looking at now, so this is quite um, new in a sense, is that you might be better to sleep for three or four hours, but consistently, rather than having that interrupted period of sleep over a longer period of time. And that, that comes back to why, um, if you have a look at the literature, a lot of diseases and disorders that are studied with poor sleep is sleep apnea. Um, and sleep apnea is the problem because you are constantly being interrupted. So you're constantly being taken away from having, experiencing slow wave sleep. Um, and beyond pain, um, slow wave sleep is so important for uh, psychological processes, memory, fatigue, all those types of things that you were mentioning before. So um, history of sleep. Um, and if you having, if you get an idea that sleep is quite an, is problematic um, for the for the, the patient, then I'll be digging into um, uh, how and why um, that sleep is problematic. Um, and if you're getting an idea that they might have certain issues that could be, um, or symptoms that might be associated with a, uh, a sleep disorder like sleep apnea, I mean, sleep apnea is something that can be very low level. A lot of people live with it, but they don't get it diagnosed. Um, so just being aware of that relationship with sleep, inflammation, and pain, and other conditions, um, that it, it might not hurt to ask them to consider getting that looked at. Um, and the devices that you can take home these days just to test for it, um, or even, um, here's the beauty as a clinician, um, it gives you another weapon for treating that problem because sleep apnea, uh, particularly low level sleep apnea, it can be so easily solved with some pretty simple medical devices now. So you might be able to, um, make a large shift in the improvement in that patient's um, quality of life, whether it's their pain or condition, just by identifying that and saying, hey, why don't you try and take one of those devices home and see how it goes. Cool. So, I mean, I we, we've historically always asked about sleep, but we listen to what you say there. It suddenly dawned on me. We always ask about duration. So we always say, how, 
how much sleep do you get on average? And we're, you know, and we're, we're normally looking for someone to say seven to eight hours. And we'll come back to that in a second about whether that's a, a reasonable sort of uh, norm, if that's the right word to use. Um, but it sounds like we should probably be asking about the quality. So, I mean, what, what are sensible questions to ask here? Things like, how, do you feel well rested when you wake up? Well, I know some people now, we've got Garmin's that allegedly tell us how how long we're sleeping for and, and they break up the phases of sleep. Is, have you got any experience with those and whether patients can use those? Are, are they valid? Are they reliable? Are they, are they a good barometer of, of how well someone's sleeping? If we're just trying to, you know, often if we ask a runner, to talk to me about your training habits, they'll open up their Strava and they'll show us their volume, their frequency, their intensity. If we're asking about their sleep, can they equally, you know, lean on, on their wearables? A really, really good question, really good series of questions in there. Um, and many of them um, are, are being studied at the moment. In fact, in our lab, um, one of the things that we're working on at the moment is validating some of these simple wearables um, as a measure of sleep quality. Taking it back to your first question about duration, um, what is uh, what is the ideal duration? Look, I think I think it's fair to say that um, anywhere between eight and nine hours. And I don't want to. I'm sure there's a textbook somewhere that has it down to the minute. Um, but the reality is, it's somewhere between eight and nine um, hours. I think would be uh, reasonable. The the general consensus from um, questionnaires that we might use um, with participants to ask whether to define whether they're not sleeping enough is a cutoff of five hours. So if you're sleeping under five hours, um, it's probably bad. Um, but sleep is um, like a lot of um, biology. It's not linear. There's not a linear relationship um, uh, with processes. So if you sleep too much, that's a bad thing as well. In fact, what we see is is that if you sleep too little, um, there's an inflammatory cascade that goes on and so on. And if, if the same sort of thing can be seen if you sleep too long. So there really is a, a happy medium there, probably between eight or nine hours, I would suggest. Um, but from the more extreme ends, um, particularly the, the, the lower end of sleep uh, hours, I would suggest anything less than five. Um, second question, I'm trying to remember them um, in a row here, quality. Um, what questions would we ask? That's a really good one as well because um, uh, it, it's challenging to dig that out. Um, I, what you said was right. Um, I think the first thing to ask them is, uh, do they feel like their sleep quality is good? Um, and then narrowing down on that would be what you said. Um, do they feel rested throughout the day? Do they feel sleepy throughout the day? I think that's an important one. Do they feel sleepy? And that, that, that's something that comes up with sleep apnea a lot, um, that they're, they're getting daytime the sleepiness, um, they refer to it as. Um, other things I would be asking is, yes, the duration, because um, it does give you a broad indicator, um, but narrowing down on it really is just some simple questions about, do they feel sleepy? Um, how long does it take them to go to sleep? That's an important one, um, because that also gives the clinician perhaps an idea of how they might be able to um, at least give some education around sleep hygiene to get them to sleep quicker. Um, and whether they're waking during the night, um, sometimes they might not be aware that they're waking, but um, some people are. So are they waking during the night a lot? Are they finding it difficult to go to sleep? Are they tired during the day? Um, and I think an important one is with shift work is, is to identify whether they're having consistent sleep patterns, right? So a lot of the time with shift workers is that they get used to a pattern um, over a week or they're slowly adapting to a pattern and then they're they're jammed over the other way, then they have to try and sleep a different way throughout a different time of the day. Um, so that's important as well. Um, what was the last question that you asked? Um, what was it? Uh, uh, Ian, it was, was it? A, <laughs> I can't remember. I can't um, remember myself. <laughs> uh, it was on the oh, wearables, wearables. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wearables. So, this is a really, okay, what I can say is, is that you're on the money because there are a lot of people out to try and make a buck with this at the moment by <laughs> um, developing wearables um, that are going to tell people, hey, we're going to tell you how to sleep well and we're going to save your life and you're going to be so much better. Um, and that's going on right now. And they're really, so it doesn't, this is what happens with, um, it's great um, because science and industry are linked. Uh, but when you get a sniff, of, when industry get a sniff of it, they want to take off with it um, and they want to justify every um, way around it possible um, to say that they're showing that they're following the science. 
they have, I think, current wearables like Fitbits, Garmin's, that type of thing. I think they have a place. Um, so what what they're going to they so they're a proxy for a lot of things, right? Um, uh, I, I think the wearables that I would be looking at um, are wearables that actually measure take on physiological information. So wearables that would um, connect uh, consider heart rate. Um, oxygen saturation in the blood, um, respiratory rate, some of them do these, some of them don't. Um, uh, and obviously a lot of them um, are measuring movement. So there's a lot of this um, data out there at the moment trying to show whether how you move during the night um, is associated with a particular um, sleep stage. That's what they're trying to do. Um, basically, the more information they're integrating, um, the more accurate they're going to be. Um, because sleep really does, each stage of sleep that I was talking about before, um, it can be characterised by certain physiological um, patterns, like how you breathe, your heart rate, blood pressure, oxygen saturation, how you're moving um, throughout the night. Um, and so the more information that you have, the better, uh, the more accurate they are. Now, the gold standard for measuring sleep or quantifying sleep is to be hooked up with EEG to the head, um, electrodes, things shoved in your nose. It's completely impractical, usually only done in a sleep lab. Um, but what we're trying to do or considering doing is um, taking that sort of device um, in home, um, trying to apply the most practical version of the gold standard, um, so wireless version of it, while, the, while you're also wearing a, a, a simple um, wearable. And then to go back, valid compare the data and see how accurate it actually is. Um, and so that's where at the moment, at the moment we really don't know that. There are studies that will will look at um, these type of things, but a lot of them are done in sleep labs. And the problem is with sleep labs, you don't sleep normally in a sleep lab. You just don't. <laughs> um, and you're hooked up with everything. It's challenging. People are waking you up doing certain things. Um, so the, it really needs to be tested in home. Um, but if we get this right, if, if we can, if we can, if, if we can validate wearables, it opens up a huge amount of opportunity for studying sleep because that's been the limiting factor with sleep studies is that we have all these associations, but we don't understand whether it's associated or it's causing something. Um, but if we can send people home for major studies, looking at thousands of people that are wearing these things, I mean, they're high throughput studies, um, it will give us major insight into what's going on with sleep with other pathologies. Um, I think the jury's still out, but I think they're useful. I do think they're useful. But it's like a lot of these wearables. If I don't know, I actually don't wear them, but if, you, if, you, if you're you wearing a wearable and you get up in the morning and you go, oh, says I, apparently I had a poor night's sleep. Now, are you going to do anything about that or are you just going to read that? I mean, that's the question as well, right? Um, perhaps, that, perhaps your wearable is going to tell you that you need to sleep more um, or sleep better. Um, the main thing that they're missing is that high level physiological information. And that's what I was coming back to before, right, with the sleep stages. So wearables at the moment, they're trying to get to being able to guesstimate sleep stages because it really is important um, how much of certain stages you might be missing. Uh, but they can't do that just yet, um, at least the very simple wearables. So I think that's where they're at. But I, I can tell you now in the next couple of years, things are going to advance in a long way. And do I think they're going to be worthwhile, potentially worthwhile? Absolutely. Um, health is a big problem. Uh, sleep is a big problem around the world. Um, and if it's something that we can tweak, it may have a huge impact on our life. And I think you're going to find industries. It's not going to be us scientists that are trying to, that are trying to tell people that, look what we found, it's important. It's what, people don't want to listen to us too much. But as soon as industry come on with a fancy ad, and say, look at this cool watch. It's got these special things on it. People are going, yeah, yeah, I'm going for that. So it probably <laughs> will be industry that gets it over the line. Yeah, I mean, it's it, you can see the seeds are being sown with already the let. Let's make sure we 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 terrify the public and society with with the the the, the negative effects of not sleeping well. 
next step is well we if you know we need to measure it to see if we are you know how much we're sleeping and you can see like you say the wearables there's a ring now i can't remember what it's called but there's a ring out there that does it now i've seen that you know you see, it on, cool. you see it on instagram and things and you're kind of like, oh i see where this is going but i, I mean i wear a wearable for, mostly for sort of running metrics but obviously I, I leave it on overnight and i've always questioned the sleep data it gives me um because as i say i'll often um be in bed and it'll be midnight and my my movement is very minimal and my heart rate is very low but because i'm lying in bed watching netflix um till two in the morning and then when i get up at six um my watch tells me you've had six hours sleep and i'm like i definitely it counted those two hours where i was watching netflix with yeah. asleep because i wasn't moving and my heart rate was low so it doesn't surprise me with the things you say um Next question. It sounds like it's it's much more sensible for us in our in our history taking rather than to say to someone, open up your your app and show me your sleep metrics. It's just to ask, like you say, those questions about duration, quality, history of sleep problems. Are you tired through the day? Next question on from that for you is who should we be asking this to now? You know, it, it makes sense to me that if we're seeing a human in pain, um, then regardless of that human or what that presenting complaint is, to my mind, we should probably be asking this of everyone, but I think it might be a tough sell for some clinicians to say, look, this this tennis player has just come in and with an acute ankle inversion ankle sprain. Um, they're going to look at me weird if I ask them about their sleep their sleep patterns. Um, what's your take from a researcher's perspective with a good understanding of, of sleep and pain and the, and the interrelations there uh, on who we should be asking it to? I mean, is, is it everyone? No, it's not everyone, um, particularly on the first visit. You know, someone gets, <laughs> someone someone's brought in in the stretcher and you look at them and you go, quick, tell me, how'd you sleep last night? And, um, <laughs> that's probably not the first question you would ask and they might slap you. Um, look, I think, um, I, let me take a step back um, just to give you an idea of, of the way we're looking at pain and how sleep might be involved. And then it might help um, pave a way for how I will answer that. Um, one of the studies that we're, look, we're doing at the moment is um, is how is looking at how day to day factors change the um, or influence the ebb and flow of pain in people with um, chronic pain conditions like back pain, for example. So uh, what we what we we've taken a step back. The the transition from acute to chronic pain is critical. Um, it's critical to understand how that's happening so that we can prevent it, but what we also know is a lot of people with chronic um, pain problems is that it's a lifelong condition. It doesn't, it might, it might go away for a period of time, but it often comes back. I think you'll find that people that have had chronic pain, they, it's not something that just gets completely eliminated. It's often a lifelong problem. And so what our research at the moment is trying to do is to look at how those symptoms on a day to day basis fluctuate. And one of the things we're looking at is how um, sleep, uh, physical activity as well, but how you sleep the night before might influence your pain, next day pain. Um, now, taking another step back another direction, when we're looking at acute to chronic pain, um, that's a difficult one um, to try and um, understand, at least tease out the mechanisms with regards to sleep, because sleep is, is it's affected by so many different things um, and when I when we consider when we're trying to understand whether sleep has a role in, in, the, in the development of chronic pain it's a very different thing to whether it has a role in your day-to-day -day pain levels right if you have a night of poor sleep um, there's a number of things that could be tweaked that could be influencing your pain levels inflammation might be one of them but how do you but can we take another step and say is your poor sleep actually contributing? Is it a cause um, from, from that initial injury that you might have, whether it's you've hurt your back, you've injured your ankle, can we, can we take a step back and, uh, or a step forward in vision and say, you know what, the way you sleep might actually dictate whether this becomes a chronic, potentially ongoing, decade-long problem or whether it's going to get better um, depending on how you sleep. Um, and that's what our research um, and another angle our research is looking at. And we can't do that in humans at the moment because anyone that comes in um, that we have, we can't control them um, to the point where sleep, sleep, the physiology of sleep is influenced by so many different things that anyone that comes in, 
there, there's there's so many confounders we can't control for at the moment. And we also can't, you know, slice into humans so much to speak and have a look what's going on. So we have uh, some of our work at the moment is looking at um, using animals to, to subject them to poor sleep um, just after they've been injured. And then we can really follow closely some of the um, pathways or mechanisms that we, that we think we hypothesize are driving this transition acute to chronic pain to see if sleep is really active, actively modulating that. Um, and we don't know yet, but we're getting we have a we're starting to get an idea that it actually does. So coming back to the question, um, do we ask everyone? Um, look, I I think if someone is coming, if someone has uh, enters the practice and they have intermittent back pain, then I think you ask. I think you ask, um, or if they have they have uh, an injury that's happened before, or it's a, um, symptoms of something, hip pain, um, joint pain. Um, if it's something that has probably hang around, hung around for a little bit, um, and they and we're trying to tease out reasons um, of not why, but also how we can why it's going, why it's that way, and how can we improve it. Then I think sleep. Ask about sleep. If someone comes in with acute injury. Um, no, um, I don't think it would be the first thing on my mind to ask uh, because there's so many different things at play right there that are going to, that you probably want to tease out first. And another part of our research is, uh, has shown that how you, you, your acute inflammatory response after you end yourself is, is critically important, right? It, I think, I think it's important, um, not just for the patient to realise, but for everyone to realise is that inflammation is a good thing. It's a normal thing. It's an adaptive process. We need it. And um, I'm, I'm a little bit conflicted sometimes with all these use of anti-inflammatories and this type of thing that are used so quickly because it, you need inflammation early. Um, that's part of the process. And sometimes we actually don't know whether that, that inflammation is going to go awry. We don't know whether it's going to be sustained, excessive or dysregulated. Um, and so sometimes that's a waiting process. But what we do know is, is that if you have a certain type of inflammatory response to an injury, that that can set you up for whether you get better or not, whether your systems persist. What we don't know is, is whether sleep has a role in that systemic inflammatory response early. And that's what we're trying to dig out. Um, so with so many factors at play early um, and so many factors that can influence systemic inflammation, I, I, I think acute injuries, Sleep wouldn't be on my mind, but if they're coming back or symptoms are persisting, that's when I'm starting to narrow down on sleep. Yeah. Just can I just just staying with the acute injury for a moment, David? I, I, again, I'm not familiar with the literature, but surely if the, 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 the probability of an acute injury is higher after a bad night's sleep. Yeah, uh, and, and and yes, and I, <laughs> I bet there's literature out there that supports a lot of that. Um, yeah. But the reasons that I'm talking about are probably yeah. very different. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, if you, uh, it, it might not be. Um, I think the reasons for having, as far as inflammation goes, if you mm. if you have a poor night's sleep and you have a spike in inflammatory levels the next day, what it might mean is that if you injure yourself, then you're you're really at risk of um, having an, an impaired or an improper inflammatory. So you, you're primed, so to speak. Mm. The immune systems like this. It's, it's, it's raised and then so it's triggered if you have an injury, um, probably excessively. That's where sleep might be a problem the night before. Yeah. But the actual risk of injury is probably because of a whole heap of psychosocial, fatigue, mental factors, that type of thing. Yeah. Now, when you, when you say the poor sleep, uh, perhaps raising the inflammatory markers, are you talking about, you know, one night of broken four hours or are you talking more of a chronic sleep? You know, over a period of time like, like if i had one bad night last night am i likely to have issues today or does that have to be repeated over a longer period of time no i mean so research is coming out showing that you can i mean what we do know is you have one night's poor sleep might only be a loss of a few hours you will likely have a spike in inflammation throughout the day systemically um now that might not be obvious if you have um other underlying diseases or disorders that are heavily driven by inflammation, then you might feel a spike in symptoms. 
if you have an injury or you have pain, like back pain, you might um, have an increase in um, stiffness associated with inflammation the next morning. You might have uh, increased pain throughout the day. So yeah, I, I, I really do believe, um, and research is really starting to support this now, that um, one night of poor sleep can influence your day-to-day -day symptoms. Hmm. Um, I, can, I can imagine you know, competitive athletes having a really bad night's sleep before the final. <laughs> <laughs> like you know it's just for a lot of other reasons and and that's probably the one night they really need to sleep well <laughs> yeah it's true um and i mean it's, it's funny you mention um uh exercise um and sport um it opens up a whole new topic um about mm. exercise involved in, in in inducing inflammation which can affect sleep um but you're right i mean i can understand what ian was saying before with sleep hygiene practices being taught now to athletes because yeah, it, it is a performance. I mean, it's it's another way, I guess, to improve performance um, for athletes, and it makes complete sense. And you you have to take us. There's a lot of things. There's a lot of things that can influence inflammation. And as I said at the start of this chat, is that inflammation is such a powerful driver of so many things. And if sleep is a powerful driver of inflammation, it's time to take notice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Coming back to um, you know the acute versus chronic kind of uh, injuries and, and whether we should ask about sleep, it's not uncommon. I'm speaking from a UK perspective. Craig can correct me if it's not reflective of podiatry in, in Australia, but it's not uncommon that by the time people come to see us in, the, in a musculoskeletal setting, at least, that we're far more likely to be seeing longer timelines. You know, someone normally is far more likely to come in with heel pain that's been bothering them for six months. Than they are that, than heel pain that's been bothering them for six days. That's just the way that yeah. primary care and things is set here. So I think about the, the patellofemoral pain we see, the exercise-induced shin pain, the, the the pathologies around the the foot and the ankle, and they're all on reasonably dare we use the word chronic or persistent timelines. By by the time they come to see us, so it feels like they should be on the the forefront of our mind when we're taking our history. Uh, not not one hundred percent of the time, but probably more often than not. I like to think we've given people a bit of an idea of the kind of questions that we, they should be asking um, and a bit of an idea of what, what good sleep looks like. Um, what if we, as the you know, uh, treating clinician, suddenly think, OK, there's, there's a few things here that, that suggest to me this person is getting really poor quality or poor quantity sleep. Um, and that may be a, a, a fact to, con to consider in this management strategy. Where, where do we go from there? I mean, do we... Um, you know, refer on to someone. Maybe now's the time to bring in what 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 good sleep hygiene looks like. You mentioned sleep hygiene a couple of times. Are there any tips we can give people initially to say, look, maybe you should see your GP, but here's a few things that we know help. Yeah, and uh, uh, these are the the real gritty questions, right? Because these are the ones that um, clinicians want to hear, um, and scientists have trouble getting across. Um, we can talk about all the other stuff all day long, and then we'd like to leave the room when those questions come up. Um, <laughs> but the, so, um, disclaimer out of the road: we're trying to, un which is where research is targeting now, is if we improve sleep, can it improve some of these things we're looking at? But to know whether it's actually the improvements in sleep that are making the difference by looking at whether it's changing some of these inflammatory pathways that we're talking about. So that's where our research is right now. Um, and as I said earlier, signs are promising um, that it's not just poor sleep is a problem um, through these inflammatory mechanisms right from the top down, but that if we're improving it, we're seeing positive changes right from the top down. So we are getting a strong indication that sleep um, really is having a direct causal um, effect relationship um, with pain and injury and whatnot. Now, as far as advice, um, treatment and that type of thing, I'm going to I'll mention a couple of things and some of these are going to be people rolling their eyes going, oh, well, they're the obvious and they are obvious. But then there are some other things. Um, so the obvious ones, let's get those out of the road with anything that improves your sleep, I think is a good thing. Um, and I think by people Googling what improves sleep is probably going to give you a lot longer list than I'll be able to give you. But, you know, removing stimulants um, later in the day, reducing coffee, screen time, getting rid of that. Um, um, diet's a big thing, um, not eating too late before you go to sleep, um, 
these type of things, and the list goes on, right? I think the main thing is um, getting across is that sleep really is important and there really is a physiological link. So it's not it's not something to push away because I think a lot of people know how to improve their sleep. I really do. It's just that they go, ah, you know, um, mm, what, what, but emphasising how important sleep is. Um, and I, you don't scare people, but one thing I will say is, is that as I keep coming back to inflammation, inflammation, systemic inflammation, is a pretty good indicator of early mortality. It's a bad thing. And as I said, if sleep influences inflammation heavily, then you have to take it seriously. It, it really is something um, to be taken seriously. What it will do, if, it, if we can raise awareness of the importance of sleep and linking it um, with some of these things, I think people are going to take more notice. So I think as a clinician, you can mention the simple things, but I think education is key explain to the patient so they can look at you and take you seriously right um that how sleep physiologically can be affecting your symptoms and through simple things it actually might have a difference and a real important difference i think that's the key for people to take you seriously with all the things out there that they know of that will probably help their sleep one thing i think is that might not be so obvious as important is what i mentioned before that if you think the, pa the patient has particular potentially sleep issues going on, um, I think that's the time that you go, you know what, you may not be considering your sleep problem or sleep issues um, as something, they may have the, the, explained to the patient, they may not have considered that as something worth going to have looked at or checked to improve. It's just not on their radar. But if they, if there's potential, if it's potentially influencing um, things that they consider more important during their day, like their pain or their injury, if that's a problem and they know that sleep might be linked, then I would consider suggesting that they go and see someone to make GP or at least go and get advice on how they might go and have that potentially undiagnosed sleep problem. It might not be significant for them as far as your sleep goes, but it may be having larger impacts. Um, so that's how what I, I would suggest is something important that a podiatrist or a clinician would suggest you know what, why don't you go and check that sleep problem out? It might actually influence your symptoms that you're having now. Yeah, and how many, if you had to put a rough ballpark, how many difficult question, possibly unanswerable question, how many people do you think actually have undiagnosed sleep problems in inverted commas versus the likes of me and Craig where we don't get enough sleep, but I don't, I don't have a sleep problem. My problem is I sit up watching too much TV. My problem is my laptop is still open at 1 a.m. That It's not a sleep problem. It's a me problem that I'm just not doing anything about. Um, you know, uh, how much do you think is just behavioral that could be pretty easily changed? A lot. Last, yeah, right. <laughs> a lot. I mean, I, I don't know what the stats are as far as sleep problems go. And um, as, as far as official dis disord disorders, um, there are certain populations that experience them more than others. Um, and, okay, this is good for me. See, so I'm thinking it all out of my mind as a clinician, trying to think as a clinician. So if a person has um, psychosocial yellow flags, uh, they might be depressed, um, mood disorders, down, um, that's something that um, might be linking with sleep. Um, so these, these things go hand in hand typically. So... Um, and my point is, from your from what you were just saying, then is that um, pe populations that tend to be uh, experiencing heavy depression or certain type of mood disorders tend to experience um, poor sleep, um, not just as a behavioural problem, but they have disorders, um, insomnia, those type of things. Um, so certain populations might be more prone um, to having an actual disorder. Um, that might be might be worthwhile considering going further than just changing your behaviour um, through education. So I think there are some populations um, that the clinician might better again take that from a history. That's why it's so important to pull on all sorts of things here. Um, and dare I say that a lot of major psychological disorders are inflammatory driven. And again, a lot of people are not aware of that, but there's a real heavy pathology. Um, uh, have a heavy pathological link with certain inflammatory mediators or cytokines um, for certain psychological disorders. Again, it, it's this cycle that goes round. Um, so that's why people that have um, 
uh, psychological disturbances, often sleep poorly um, because they're changing inflammatory levels and that type of thing. Yeah, and this is the fascinating thing I think with this is that we're not we're not you know as podiatrists we're not just you know um, fixing feet we're we're treating humans and and the complex ecosystem that is the human body and you can't you just can't isolate you know various parts of this and and treat it you know individually can you um it's quite clear how important it is it's quite clear that we have tools at our disposal to to question um how well someone's doing with it um as craig's already said i think there's research that the less you get the more likely you might be to be injured or the less you get the more your know, infl inflammation you have the more sensitive you are craig I, i'm not familiar with the, the literature outside of the msk world but you've even pulled some things out of the world of diabetes is it does it slow down the healing or recovery oh, no, I think, I think within the within the diabetes literature there is a lot of evidence linking sleep to diabetes uh sleep to diabetic foot ulcers as a both as a risk factor and as a factor in the poor healing you, you know it's, it's just and I'm sure probably in any discipline, sleep is probably an issue now, <laughs> you know, that it wasn't. And, and I think one thing, just, I was just thinking now, you go back 15, 20 years and look at, um, say, the textbooks on fibromyalgia and you know, they list the clinical features and sleep might be in the small print. <laughs> you know, and, and with time, you know, sleep's moved up. Now, potentially, sleep's now been moved to the etiology section of the textbook you know like it's it's but yes you know, that it's that and i think probably what's happened in fibromyalgia might reflect probably what's happened in the in the general literature that the sleep's been in the small print under symptoms and and i wonder if you explain that david that link between okay that that sleep's not necessarily a symptom of fibromyalgia it might actually be a a, a leading factor in the cause of it now well not actually fibromyalgia and chronic pain in general yeah, it comes back to what I was saying earlier that um, uh, and, and the research that, research that we're doing, um, we, we know that, um, again, sleep influences inflammation. We need to, but we need to know whether over a period of time, whether that sleep-driven infl inflammation is contributing to that transition to chronic pain. Um, and that's what we're trying to understand. I, it, it certainly looks like it's probably the case. I think at the very least, it probably has a role. Um, how much of a role, we don't know. Um, and this is where it comes back to other conditions. I know you mentioned diabetes. Um, I'm certainly not an expert in that area, but um, again, diabetes is a is associated with um, low grade systemic inflammation. So people with diabetes probably sleep poorly um, compared to the the the, the, standard, the, the general population. Um, and why they sleep poorly could be for a variety of reasons. But I'm sure that they're probably tweaking or disturbing their sleep through changing their inflammatory profile um, with the condition. Um, and as far as fibromyalgia goes, um, and other, other problems like um, uh, di uh, disorders like uh, diabetes, I know you mentioned, or perhaps you've spoken to me earlier about with ulcers um, mm. and that type of thing. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you my perspective um, on ulcers, foot ulcers in the realms of sleep and then I will take then I will take a step back and go, gee, isn't it difficult then if we have to consider everything in the whole system when we treat <laughs> a problem? And that's yeah. the challenge. Um, and I, I so with diet with foot ulcers associated with diabetes. Again, I'm not an expert. Um, my understanding is, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not the expert here. I I imagine that there's the, the that loss of sensation um, in the in the extremities uh, probably leads leads to increased pressure on some trigger points um, and eventually micro trauma breakdown. Is that, am I on the right track here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And so, uh, from a broad sense, that 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 seems completely unrelated to sleep. Um, and you know what, sleep is probably not a big issue right there and then if you look at it that way. Um, the the underlying problem is that the person's losing sensation, so they can't feel that pressure um, in their foot. And I would think that that loss of sensation is probably caused by excess um, glucose in the blood. Sugar in the blood is damaging the nerves if it's in too high concentration. Um, now, diabetes is also associated with systemic inflammation. Um, that's altering sleep probably um, in some capacity. Now, if you sleep poorly, don't even think of it as um, what inflammation could be doing. 
because directly that inflammation, if you're if you if your sleep is contributing to the inflammatory cycle in your body, there is pretty good evidence now that there are pathways linking well, that change in systemic inflammation. So whatever you have floating around your body, your blood, that, that communicates with the peripheral tissues to then impact inflammation within those tissues, whether it's your muscles, your skin, your nerves, there is, and that relationship is bi-directional, it can go both ways. So if you can change anything that changes your systemic inflammation, might in effect be impacting what's happening at the tissue level. Now, outside of the direct um, inflammatory response from loss of sleep is that changes in sleep alter um, cortisol. Oh, we've lost someone, have we? Yeah, Ian, Ian's gone. Oh, well, he'll be back. <laughs> I, I've made him. I've made him that bored, have I? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you changes in cortisol, which happens with sleep, um, sleep cortisol is very sensitive to sleep changes um, and inflammation. Cortisol itself is in, involved in um, regulating blood glucose. Oh, yeah. Ian's back. <laughs> um, and so if cortisol is another factor from um, changes in sleep, if that's changing and changes in cortisol can affect or influence your blood glucose levels, well, that's another way that um, sleep may be um, actually having a role in um, affecting your nerves. Um, if, if it's blood glucose that's actually damaging the nerves, well, then sleep has a role in that as well. So there's so many ways to look at it. Um, and perhaps I, I did mention earlier before we started this whether I could share my screen because um, it is a pretty good timing, a pretty good time to actually go yeah. through that if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, just to uh... yeah, this is why you're doing that, David. I mean, yeah. it, it, what, what you're saying there in diabetes is that that the same with fibromyalgia. It's it's sort of going probably going both ways. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's a two-way process. So taking a step back, then uh, it's really the it is. It, it sounds like we're trying to make it more challenging for the clinician, right? So patient goes in. We suggest that you look at every conceivable possible factor and then make up your mind what's going on. Um, we're not trying to do that. We're just trying to tease out the complex um, the complex reality that is biology. Um, and I mean. A Inflammation itself is, is, is complicated. And I think if, um, if, if how we treat inflammation from a pharmacotherapy point of view is any indication, uh, it just goes to show you how far away we are from actually understanding um, inflammation. If you throw um, anti-inflammatory treatments at people, um, we certainly know from animal studies, if you, you, you damage a tissue, you injure the muscle, whatever it may be, well, and you create um, an over-the-top inflammatory response, so apparently it's bad, you you give that animal an inflammatory treatment, um, well, guess what? Some things get better, but some things get worse. So th th we're talking about literally um, thousands, millions of things working together, and so you can't just shotgun it and just think that it's going to get better. There's some things that are not going to work out. And that's sort of the thing when we look at this as a whole system. Um, the figure I'm just showing on the screen here is um, from a paper we've literally just published um, where we're actually trying to link um, from evidence that we've known for a long time but also new evidence and I think it's been the elephant in the room for the last little while and we wanted to put it out there as a bit of a hypothesis driven topic so we can open up new research is how some of these things um, from a psychosocial and lifestyle perspective really can actually influence um, biology at the tissue level so whether it's an injury or what not and um, what I will sh you can see sleep is in there um, and there's a number of lines going around here and I guess the point I'm trying to make is that sleep here if you look at it it can affect your psychosocial status which can affect systemic inflammation or your nervous system, which then feeds back on a systemic inflammation. And all this can come back to your local inflammation at the tissue level and change things like connective tissue and fibrosis. If you're thinking from a uh, clinical point of view, I, I imagine um, fibrosis, excess connective tissue, that type of thing is a problem um, in the foot with certain injuries. Um, 
But then all the other factors that can influence sleep, and maybe this is a good way of looking at it when you're trying to educate someone about how they might improve their sleep, is that uh, diet, alcohol, um, physical activity, a whole range of different things that kind of come back and influence sleep. And again, that feeds back on itself. Um, and so it's not to overwhelm someone when they look at this type of thing, but it's to, it, 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 it certainly highlights that it's a whole system approach. When you're dealing with pain or injury, typically there are certain factors that have more of an influence than others. And I guess that's the clinician's role, right? There might be many things going on, but you really need to identify what are the most important things. And that is so challenging. Um, I can imagine, I couldn't imagine being a clinician trying to come up with that. I get to look at something very specifically um, in a laboratory. Having to be faced with that in reality is challenging. Um, but sleep is important because as you can see, there's a lot of, um, it, it really does, it does affect a lot of things and there's a lot of arrows coming back to it. Um, so that's all I wanted to show with that. Um, and the nice thing about that paper is that it actually does go into, for anyone that's interested, it actually ties up the physiological mechanisms that might be underpinning each of those pathways. Um, so it, from an educational point of view, it does help to embed in your mind why sleep is so important. Um, Perfect. I don't know we'll, I'm on track there. we'll definitely get the link for that if that's okay david and put it in the um put it in the comments below and just wrapping up because we're nearly at the hour it just it just suddenly dawned on me how how we, when we think about a history we take from a patient we spend so much time asking them about the 14 or 15 hours that they're, they're awake so you know what shoes they wear what activities they do their occupation their their their, their, their the sort of demands they place on their body why wouldn't we ask about the nine or 10 hours, uh, the, other, the other part of the day? Why, why would we not ask questions about that? You know, um, so you know, for any clinicians watching, you know, ask yourself, how much do you ask about sleep, if at all? And, and uh, do you think you, sh you could or should ask a bit more about how well someone's sleeping, the quality, the, the quantity? Um, we'll, we'll put some links down to, to David's work and David's research. Um, Craig, is there anything uh, that's come through on the Facebook as we've been going along? No, no, I think I think people have been intensely listening. To We've had quite a few people watching. I'm the oh, only comment. Yeah. I just, the only comment I, said, uh, I just realized I said, yeah. is there anything that's come through on the Facebook? I suddenly sounded like, like my dad then. Oh, I meant on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, the only comments we got about are about the footy. So you know quite, quite right <laughs> yeah. quite right yeah it's uh it's coming so look, you know the hour's gone really quickly so look thanks so much david i mean i think sleep's been on our horizon and increasing frequency turning up in the literature and you know i know we've been looking for a while for someone who we could um invite on to to talk about um sleep and it was obviously that interview you did with channel nine um got a lot of mileage and it's certainly attracted you know um so that's been really good been really interesting for those who've just joined um come back in 10 minutes the full video will be there i'll have it up on youtube uh later on today so thanks very much david thanks david brilliant thank you for having me appreciate it